government by the military-industrial complex came to pass. President John F. Kennedy had enraged the entire elite network. Now, Kennedy was brought in as somebody who was expected to be a puppet. It was thought that his pro-Nazi father, Joseph P. Kennedy, the bootlegger, the speculator, would uh, guarantee that Kennedy would be obedient to the establishment. They thought that Kennedy was a sex maniac who, who could be manipulated through all of this, but it turned out that through his personal suffering, Kennedy had discovered a personal sense of himself which went beyond just being a puppet, and he began to think about things like economic recovery, world peace, having a space program, uh, making deals with uh, the Soviets, cutting the uh, Federal Reserve down to size, and a whole series of other things. Executive Order Number 11110, signed by President Kennedy, began the process of abolishing the private Federal Reserve. Kennedy was also pushing for real civil rights reform and had begun the process of pulling the troops out of Vietnam. The last time you had an actual president was uh, Kennedy. The oligarchs took swift and decisive action when John Kennedy attempted to take the government back from the robber barons, he was brutally murdered. The message to future U.S. presidents and leaders across the world was clear. Do as you're told or die. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was the last true president of the United States. And until the globalists are removed from power, we will never have another real one. The other thing about the American presidency you've got to remember is that this is a puppet post. It's automatically going to be a puppet post. The idea that Obama is somebody who's going to come in and exercise real authority when he's obviously been chosen and given everything that he's got by these financiers. Presidents are now little more than corporate pitch men who take all the political heat while the controllers remain in the shadows, safe from public scrutiny. Hip-hop icon KRS-One is not just known for selling millions of albums. He has led a tireless crusade against youth violence and has been a strong voice for human rights. If they controlled it before, what are you, why don't, what makes you think they're not controlling it now? The country was on a verge of revolution. They threw a black man up. Now we like this. They give him the money. They give him the bundling, they give him vote fraud, they give him the media whores, they give him goons, they even have elected officials making threats to put people in jail if they criticize Obama in public. All of this is the mark of a puppet, uh, and that means that he is uh, a puppet, actually more of a puppet than anybody else, more of a puppet than Mrs. Clinton would have been, even more of a puppet than, than McCain. He's the maximum puppet that we've had certainly since, since Jimmy Carter. They put a black face on the new world order, and now we all happy. KRS ain't buying it. In the real executive power structure, the president serves the military-industrial complex. It's self-owned by the international bankers. If there's a revolution, the population just throws out the prime minister or president. The elite stays in power because the public is never aware of who the real enemy is. In Evian, France in 1991, standing before the Bilderberg Group, the apex of the world government power structure, David Rockefeller defined the New World Order as a system of world government serving the international banking elite. For decades, the banker-owned media would attack anyone who dared to warn the public that a dictatorial world government was being constructed right under their nose, and that national sovereignty was being deliberately destroyed. And now, after years of denial, the media and the elite themselves are proudly announcing that not only is world government real, but it is the answer to the financial crisis that they carefully engineered. Suddenly, the Wall Street Journal tells us that the North American Union is here and that getting rid of the dollar for a common currency with Canada and Mexico is good. The Financial Times of London published by a member of the Bilderberg Group, crowed that a dictatorial world government had been kept in the shadows for our own good and that it was now time for it to emerge from behind the curtains of national security. White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel stated on record that they can't let this crisis go to waste. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. And Henry Kissinger, 
who gave Barack Obama his first job out of college, told national television that the economic collapse was a great opportunity to bring in the New World Order. He went on to say that Barack Obama was the perfect person to sell it to the world. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. In June of 2006, our team traveled to Ottawa, Canada to gather intelligence on the shadow government's agenda for the coming years. I think that's the queen. Investigative journalist and best-selling author Daniel Estelin had been tracking the Bilderberg Group for more than 16 years. His moles inside Bilderberg informed him that the elite were planning to first run the price of gas up to $150 a barrel, unimaginable in 2006. He also reported that after suckering the middle class back into the stock market, the group was going to implode the subprime mortgage market and destroy public confidence. Well, one of the things that, you know, we're getting from this morning in this afternoon's conference, this morning conference was about the, uh, the, the energy crisis, the price of oil. This, the afternoon conference, which started about 4 o'clock, 4, 4.30, they were talking about uh, one of the American delegates, I, I wasn't told who exactly he was, was talking about the, uh, <clears throat> the concern that the American citizens have had with the, with, you know, with the housing prices going down, so they're not investing that money. So what they needed to do is they needed to create the illusion that everything is going well. So what they're going to do over the next year, year and a half, is to bring the market back up to 1998, 1999 levels. They're going to get all the suckers to invest whatever little money they have left over, <clears throat> and that's when they're going to make the economy bottom drop out. They need to destroy the economy because as we're running out of oil, when people don't travel, at least that's what they're saying, when people don't travel, when people don't have money, they don't travel, they don't spend any money, which means you don't waste a lot of uh, 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 oil and natural gas. That's the afternoon. So how does this source, I mean, just ballpark, I mean, so, so you have the sources of... Well, actually, there are two people uh, who are members of the Bilderberg Club. It's actually members that are... They're members of, they're they're members of the Bilderberg Club who, for years and years and years, have been going and participating in all the conversations. They've always been dead on, always. And last year, they said the oil prices are going to go up to 150. At the time, it was 39. It went up to 76, yeah. basically doubled. If it doubles again, it's going to be back to where these people... They attack Iran and will it on Year after year, Estelin and other reporters like Jim Tucker are able to report on future events with stunning accuracy. All because they know the agenda of the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group sits at the top of the world power structure. 125 of the richest and most influential individuals on the globe make up its membership. From Istanbul, Turkey to Chantilly, Virginia, we have tracked the elusive Bilderberg Group. Bilderberg always insist on a media blackout. By June of 2008, we had already figured out that Barack Obama was the elite's puppet of choice. The national media claimed that during the weekend the Bilderberg Group was scheduled to meet, that Obama had speaking engagements set for Chicago and the Midwest. We knew better. In a classic bait-and-switch, the Obama campaign told the press corps to get on Obama's campaign plane and that Obama would join them on the flight to Chicago. Campaign staff then slammed the door shut. The fawning press had been shanghaied as Obama's campaign aircraft lifted off without Obama. Robert, why were we not told about this meeting and that the senator wouldn't be on our flight until the doors were shut and we were about the taxi to take off? Again, uh uh, you know, uh, we had a desire, Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. And we set up these meetings. They're being, they're being done tonight. Again, I, I'm... I, Is there more than one meeting? Is there more than one person with whom... You're... I'm not going to get into all the details of the meetings. I, 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 I don't know that I've got a ton more different answers for all of your questions. Obama wasn't going to Chicago. He had a meeting to attend, a secret meeting. Initially, it was believed that the secret meeting took place at Clinton's Washington, D.C. home. Obama's spokesman denied that, but won't confirm where the former rivals met. 
He also declined to comment on their topics of discussion. For a day and a half, the mainstream media engaged in a wild goose chase, trying to find out where Hillary and Obama had gone. Three cover stories later, the corporate press had to admit they had no idea where the two candidates had gone. And to this day, Clinton and Obama aren't talking. Plenty of sources knew about this meeting, uh, told us and others that it was at Hillary Clinton's house, but clearly uh, it wasn't. In 2008, the trail led us to the Westfields Marriott Hotel, right outside Washington, D.C. We just flew into Washington, D.C. We're driving to the Westfields Marriott. Tomorrow, the hotel's closed throughout the week, into the weekend for the Bilderberg Group meeting. But we're going to check in the night before. They're going to kick us out tomorrow. So we're going directly into the belly of the beast. The hotel will be filled with at least five spy agencies. CIA, Defense Intelligence, Mossad, uh, European Union Security. We checked into the Westfields Marriott 48 hours before hotel guests were scheduled to be thrown out ahead of the annual meeting. The building was nestled in the heart of the military industrial complex with the National Reconnaissance Office and Raytheon just a stone's throw away. The plan tonight is to try to not get arrested, dodge the security, get in there, get some, some footage of the elite arriving in the morning because some arrive before they officially lock it down and then getting out of the building. Uh, that's our plan. I'm also going to be uh, getting a call by an uh, international uh, syndicated radio show, Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, and all week he's getting briefings from me every night uh, about things as they develop. George, we're sitting here in the room. As the phone rings with your producer, Tom Danhauser, to put me on, the fire alarm goes off. Uh, so everybody is exiting the building. I know this is a setup. They timed it exactly when this happened. Open the door. I want them to hear the fire alarm. Open the door. I want people to hear this live to the you know, 16 million people listening. George, do you hear that? Now, 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 they're going to use this as an excuse. The Westfields Marriott, right outside D.C. in Chantilly, they want to use this to flush us out of here. They're very upset. Everybody that covers Bilderberg, I was detained two years ago, interrogated, screamed at. They said Bilderberg was upset about me, wanted to stop us. Uh, this is guaranteed. Everywhere we go, we're followed. We have another hotel across town as a base of operations. They were there uh, questioning us, getting in our faces. We're being followed everywhere. I need everybody's support right now. I pray to God they don't try to set me up. They may have tried to concoct this as some way to say, you know, look, they didn't leave during a fire drill, assessing me knowing I would stay and do the interview. But again, the moment the phone rang with Tom Danheiser, uh, the moment the phone rang, the guys answered it, I'm standing there, the alarm goes off. Uh, it's going off right now. The guests are exiting the hotel out there. Of course, there's no fire. Uh, this is just absolutely insane. I noticed, too, that there was over 100 security people here today, but tonight we got back and it was a total ghost town, and this is what's insane. We have a security guy walk up to us 30 minutes ago, about 25 minutes ago, before this happened, and said, what are you guys doing? We said, we're just walking around checking out the artwork in the hotel, which we actually were admiring, but we were also going around getting some footage. And uh, you know, they said, well, no cameras allowed. We said, fine. And then he said, yeah, we had somebody do a fire alarm a few weeks ago.